Okay, <clears throat> Philip, I think we can start if you want to. Uh, yes, sure. Let's, uh, you know, the show must go on. So let's start. People will be joining us. So namaste, good morning, afternoon and evening. First of all, I'd like to welcome you all to this session. Uh, this year, a new approach was taken with the mentorship program. And this open session is a crucial part of the program for better engagement. This year, we had eight mentors, including me. Uh, our mentors were uh, Dr. Sudha, Yon Chung, Shibendu, Pablo, Rajaram, Maureen Hilliard, and Sudish. Uh, and we tried to facilitate the fellows in the most proactive and robust way. In this session, we have two segments, two theme talk and one flash talk. In each segment, we have listed speakers. They will share their ideas, thoughts, experience, and knowledge. So without wasting time, let's start the session. So first uh, theme, we have accessibility. Here we have six speakers. Let me hand the mic to the group. Uh, please introduce your group members and start the session. And you have 20 minutes, including Q&A. The mic is to you, to the group. A very warm welcome. Uh, my name is Warren, and I'm happy to facilitate and moderate the session on diversity and inclusion. Uh, with me, I have our panelists today. First, we have Nirosha Wedesinghe, an academic from Kota Lawala Defense University in Sri Lanka. Um, and we also, well, welcome, welcome, Nirosha. And uh, we also have Pio, a tertiary student from Myanmar. Uh, Nirosha and Pio will discuss about accessibility issues in their regions. Nirosha and Pio, welcome to the session. Thank okay, you, Sandan. Uh, Thank you. Um, Nirosha, would you like to start? Uh, let's let's talk about some of the overarching challenges in terms of accessibility in your country. Yes, sir. Uh, majority of uh, Sri Lankan differently able people are getting difficulties of accessing web applications and mobile applications due to a poor implementation considerations taken by developers and respective stakeholders in Sri Lanka. Okay, um, Theo, would you like to uh, discuss about accessibility challenges? Uh, thank you, Soren, for inviting me to uh, this session. And also, can you move to the next slide, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Pio from Myanmar. And as you know, uh, since February, we have been and uh, suffered the frequent internet outage in different regions and states. And currently, uh, here is the update information uh, that has been uh, inter internet has been cut off in these places uh, in two to 25 townships in the uh, five region and state, as I mentioned here. And moreover, uh, People from the, these places can assess the information, education, and also other opportunity. And on the other hand, they are growing their fear uh, because of the internet uh, has been denied, assessed denied in their places. I see. Thank you. Uh, Nirusha, uh, would you like to discuss some of the current initiatives uh, that uh, are happening in Sri Lanka to help address the gaps in accessibility? Yes, Savran. Uh, there are several initiations have been taken by the Internet Society in Sri Lanka chapter and the ICT agency in Sri Lanka. Under the guidance of many Kunilatna, they have initiated many programs to solve these issues. And they are continually kept on training web developers, conducting awareness and training programs. Uh, in the process of web and mobile application development, they have proposed to get involvement of people with uh, different types of disabilities, including hearing, reading, and visual impairment. Uh, these depths, uh, the group of people are involving in the development process, uh, but with current survey results reveal that there is a lack of awareness of careless considerations taken by web accessibility needs by the web developers. Many accessibility widgets are available to download, but uh, they are not used. 
So my first suggestion is uh, we must uh, appoint country level ambassadors to study and deep investigation on the issues and they could be responsible agents to the government legal framework. And also my the second suggestion is to uh, restructure of current legal framework to support to this marginalized group of people in relation to the accessibility issues. So uh, I would like to say internet is for everyone, uh, therefore facilitating a proper international level uh, legal framework would be helpful for these marginalized group of people to overcome these issues. Completely agree, uh, particularly with uh, you know having ambassadors because uh, these are the ones who, who you know consistently chase authorities and the stakeholders to ensure things actually happen. And there's a lot of lobbying that happens, you know. So I, I completely agree with you. Uh, let's move on to Pio. Pio, you discussed some uh, rather pressing issues, and we do understand it may not be easy to uh, combat them. Is there anything that the citizens or the private sector is is doing to help uh, address these issues? Yes, due to the political Taiwan, there's no solution for the from the people who are currently holding the digital framework. But the citizens are trying to um, assess the internet information and communication using VPNs and virtual private network. And there's this a a huge digital device in memory, and new internet users are struggling to. I get connected also those few that can access the internet do so at the very low space and bandwidth and try different kinds of VPN in places where internet outage happens. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. Now let's move on to our next two participants. Uh, we have uh, Johanny Ranisinga, an academic from University of Colombo, and Brinda Desh, who is uh, from the civil society in India, to discuss about digital education. Uh, welcome, ladies. Hello, sir. As well. Okay, so let's hear from Johanny first. Uh, Johanny, could you please tell us about uh, uh, some of the issues pertaining to uh, digital education in, in Sri Lanka and what is happening in yes, terms of thank addressing? Thank you, Sarah. As you all know, due to the pandemic, internet has become the life savior for many fields, including education. Therefore, accessibility and affordability to internet is very important to make sure education is not a luxury for many people again. Internet has become the key to provide equitable access to education, which is again a United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In Sri Lanka, around 4 million students have affected by the closure of schools and education system has completely moved to online as everyone else. Actually, we did a survey using 427 undergraduate students and we saw nearly 20% of them had issues with internet access. The problem is threefold. For some students, accessibility to internet is challenging due to economic barriers. For some, due to living location, uh, there are areas with less coverage and also, unfortunately, for some, no coverage at all. And thirdly, technical barriers like no enough knowledge uh, to use the technology and also no devices. So this is the situation in undergraduate level. So we can't expect something better in uh, school children. The main concern for a country like Sri Lanka is education is the bridge for many less privileged children to go to their dreams. So not only that, if we fail to provide education for all, as a country, the whole country will have to pay for this in future. So in very short, that's the situation in Sri Lanka. And I believe this is same for many other countries in the world. Thank you. Yes, uh, I must agree. The same has been happening in Fiji and the Pacific at large. And uh, we, we also have similar type of issues that you have discussed about. But of course, there needs to be more intensive studies. Uh, to help, um, you know, identify the issues and then work towards uh, solving them. Okay, let's hear from Brinda Desh now. Brinda, welcome. Over to you. Hi, Swan. Thank you. Uh, and I really appreciate if you could just zoom in onto the slide. I have a lot of text on the screen. Right. Uh, so with my experience as a teacher with Teach for India, uh, having taught in low-income communities, I'll be focusing on online education in India, especially for the school-going children. So if you can see on the slide, there's some alarming statistics about India present on the screen about the number of children that were affected due to the closure in, of the schools. And the pictures that you see 
uh, on the screen uh, about children sharing the, the devices and they're climbing on the trees to access the internet to join online classes were very common sites during the pandemic. Uh, if you could look at Asur's study on the screen as well, the existing digital inequality uh, present it just widened during the pandemic and the gap between the haves and the have-nots uh, worsened because the education sector was not well equipped to deal with the learning going digital even in the remotest places. So apart from the issues of the accessibility, availability and affordability of internet and the digital devices, access to relevant content, the digital readiness and literacy of the teachers and the students and prevalence of gender digital divide in our country acted as major roadblocks in providing quality education to all. So also, we've not been able to support many learners at the risk of exclusion from the marginalized communities, such as uh, linguistic minorities, children of refugees, children with disabilities, and hearing and visual impairment. So that's the current status of uh, uh, the digital education in India right now. Okay, uh, that's uh, quite a lot, in fact. And, and I must admit, the um, statistics here are quite alarming. But I can also see that there's some very good initiatives that are being taken. But first, let's hear from Yohani. Uh, Yohani, would you like to speak about some uh, uh, current initiatives or if, if you feel that there aren't in enough initiatives, do you suggest some solutions that you feel as an academic should be taken on uh, by all the stakeholders? Uh, yes, sir. And as a country, we have identified these issues and many initiatives have taken by the private sector, government, and even in individual capacity. Many uh, education data plans were initiated by ISPs initially, then uh, private sector has introduced uh, data scholarship programs for students in rural areas. And as the government, uh, they restructured the NanoCell centers uh, where the students can get uh, internet access for free. And also we have dedicated TV channels um, where the students can get educational content. And in individual capacity also, many initiatives were taken to introduce uh, like scholarships or giveaway devices for those students. And these are some of the initiatives actually, but definitely it is not enough. Yes, I agree. Uh, I recently spoke to a, a child. He was uh, the son of a market vendor and he told me he only gets one hour access per week. So definitely that, that is not enough. We have similar initiatives, but of course it's not enough. Uh, the disparities pertaining to the gadgets is also a very huge challenge. Okay, yes. uh, let's hear from Brinda now. Would you like to highlight some of uh, the initiatives by uh, government of what you have on the slide? Sure, uh, Swan. So to achieve our country's commitment to the uh, sustainable development uh, goals, so many initiatives have been taken under the Digital India screen, so which have been highlighted on the screen, but in the con due to the constraint of time, I'll just touch upon two of the recent ones. Uh, the first being the National Digital Education Architecture, which was announced in the previous budget to strengthen the country's digital infrastructure for education ecosystem, and the National Education Policy 2020, which also advocates for uh, digital education to improve learning outcomes and 21st century skills. Apart from that, there are some existing infrastructures for example, common service centers in the remote, uh, the urban and rural towns, they serve as access points for delivery of various e-services, which includes education as well. Uh, so just also to improve digital inclusion overall, uh, there has been the Bharat Net project under the National Broadband Mission, which aims to provide broadband to all villages by 2022. And even with the accessibility to devices, it is very crucial for the citizens to understand how to use the internet to their benefit, which is exactly the aim of the National Digital Literacy Mission as well. Uh, apart from that, could I also just add in a very quick suggestion here, Swaran, just 30 seconds. Yes, uh, so apart from that, when we speak about uh, digital education in the multi-stakeholder setting, it is also very important for children to be uh, representatives of what needs to be done in the educational, uh, digital education space as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, uh, we, we also have similar types of solutions being discussed. Well, not all of them, but similar types of solutions being discussed in the Pacific. And uh, one of them was to have little hubs in uh, different towns. Uh, and uh, of course, there would be people from uh, the communities to man those hubs and to be able to ensure, you know, students get access. And, and our teachers also, you know, climb on trees. They are on top of these uh, uh, hills and mountains to be able to get network access. So, you know, salute to them. And you as well. Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's hear from Yen Ta uh, from Vietnam. Welcome, Yen. Uh, Yen will be talking to us about digital economy. 
Hi everyone, my name is Yen. I'm from private sector from Vietnam. And uh, from my exposure to SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized enterprise environment, I would like to share some perspectives on the current state of their inclusion in uh, digital economy. You know, SME are expected to be the backbone of digital economy, uh, especially in the emerging countries like Vietnam and ASEAN countries, because they account for a dominant part and the main contrib contributor of private sector. Uh, as can be seen on the screen, um, you can see the, their dominant uh, part in our economy. Uh, so the, uh, the digital transformation is strongly, you know, taking place around the world, but even amidst enterprises, especially SMEs, the speed is kind of modest. Uh, a survey uh, conducted by Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry at more than 400 businesses in 2020 showed that only half of those businesses actually transformed uh, to digital business uh, like uh, digitalize their business. Uh, that means the other half in this survey, uh, they have not actively converted to digital. Um, the reason for this is due to lack of digital mindset, knowledge about necessary technologies and insights into customer and operational data. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Would you like to discuss any initiative uh, that you feel yeah. is, is currently happening? Yeah, of course, of course, many initiatives has uh, have been um, implementing to facilitate uh, the inclusion of SMEs in um, digital economy. Uh, regarding SME, under, especially under uh, the context caused by the COVID-19, digi uh, digitalization is a must for SMEs to survive. So uh, they, uh, uh, the context push the SMEs have to be more actively participating in digitalization. Regarding Vietnamese government, yeah, our Ministry of Planning and Investment uh, is drafting a uh, program supporting SMEs uh, with digitalization uh, for the period of uh, 2021 and 2025. Uh, and for some uh, international organizations like World Bank, they're also uh, providing us the assistance with financial aid and um, technical support to facilitate the inclusion of SMEs uh, in digital economy. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Yen. And uh, I've been reminded that we have five minutes, so we would now like to open the floor to uh, questions and comments if there's any. Please do raise your hand and uh, you will be unmuted and you can ask your question or you can also use the chat box. Okay, we- Ngo has a question, has his hand up. Yeah, you, uh, yeah if I may. Uh... I want to ask a okay. question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, one of the problems is in this pandemic. It's uh, about the the, the uh, distance uh, learning or distance uh, education. That, uh, in my experience, uh, in most of in develop, uh, developing countries, that we usually hand in hand to provide like a uh, low, uh, I mean, uh, a quota for the internet and some other uh, initiative. Uh, but uh, we, I think uh, the, the, the umbrella of this kind of uh, uh, initiatives is a policy that uh, at least, uh, at least the, like the private sector, sector they, 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 they can help if they, uh, but they, they will still uh, consider about the business uh, aspects. So uh, I think that the parliament or the government should have uh, more, more uh, like more advanced uh, 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 steps to to uh, to create the environment that uh, all the uh, sectors can can help each other. Because uh, uh, in civil society or NGOs, there are there are many NGOs that uh, helping these this, this kids, uh, these this school children to to get uh, their uh, uh, to get to their gadget, to go to the internet, to get online with. Uh, access points in some places, something like that. But the government, uh, including the local or in provincial government, they should take more step uh, ahead 
uh, of this uh, of us something like that so i think that's also a a very uh, important uh, message uh, and, i mean for me to 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 government because when i see it uh, not not many uh, uh, government uh, take this this kind of step yeah civil society did and business sector sometimes they 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 do this because of their uh, csr or something and then like uh, prof, uh, uh, internet providers and also like uh, communication at uh, telco they 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 use uh, some uh, they have their policy or some kind of policy but it is in the line of business but uh, for the government they have responsible to to uh, to, uh, to to uh, to provide this kind of uh, uh, access to the general education because of this the, the kids is our future and i think that's uh, my opinion about this uh, uh, Yeah, this 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 sense of uh, educational uh, thing and I mean digital education. Yeah, in this pandemic. Thank you, Thank yeah. you very much. Yes, a multi-stakeholder approach is very much needed. It cannot happen with just one person or one uh, community. Um, sorry, we have. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, yes, I think we have uh, one minute, so we can okay. surely. Uh, Rohit, would you like to speak now? Uh, yeah. Okay. So my suggestion is I would like to actually go on the more technical aspects of it. Uh, I guess in the few months I have met few uh, children and they were disconnected from the education and they were in the online platform for two years. And now they are very disinterested in following such a platform when it comes to education. So whilst I was actually uh, researching on how you can improve it and still be connected with the technology, and how the government can also help is we can focus on augmented and virtual reality now the thing with this is what people assume that they are very expensive but it's not these are open sources you just need skilled people to work on this so if there is a good knowledge transfer and propagation from the government and few skilled engineers to work on it we can actually make it a dream and you know make it a, a new thing that can actually come along so this is what i observed and what i felt Thank you very much, Rohit. Um, uh, actually, very quickly, I'd like to share in Fiji, uh, one of uh, the uh, postgraduate students has created a digital literacy tool, which first of all measures digital literacy in uh, five different aspects and also has remediation modules inbuilt. So uh, that has been proven to be quite helpful and it's you know based on uh, Pacific centric issues. Um, So uh, I think we don't have uh, time now, so we better wrap up. So yes, uh, just to wrap up, we have had some great suggestions ranging from ambassadors to uh, you know, robust legislation, multi-stakeholder approach, equitable access, uh, UN SDG goals. Uh, then of course, we have some of the disparities. We have some of the barriers uh, you know, pertaining to economic, uh, geographic and uh, technical issues. So, um, It's good to see that there are some very good initi initiatives taking place, and I believe there would be some more in the near future. Thank you very much to the panelists, and uh, I hope we're on time. Uh, thank you, Swara, for and the group for the wonderful knowledge and experience. And uh, and I think uh, that was an all all women uh, group, and uh, you know that was kind of like very interesting. You know, women women rock. <laughs> so now uh, let's get back to the session. Now we have a uh, cybersecurity trust. Uh, in this team talk, we have four speakers. Um, I'd like to hand over the mic uh, to Kora. Please introduce your group. You have 20 minutes, including the Q&A. Kora, you have the mic. Can someone unmute Kora? Kora, can you hear us? In the meantime, you know, you can uh, even chat uh, in, in the chat box. Uh, you can uh, express your opinions, ideas, thought about what the speakers are saying. Uh, please uh, do uh, use your social media as well. Uh, we, we are technically trying to connect with Cora. Cora, can you listen, can you hear us? Can
Okay, um, I think we have lost her. Can someone else in the group? Um, okay. Can someone from the group take a lead? Uh, you know, Samik, Diksha? Or uh, and can, we the, can, can we do the flash talks first then? I don't know, because like she was supposed to lead. So. Yeah, no. No worries. Uh, if, 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 if the speakers are ready, then we can certainly go ahead with the, uh, you know, flash talk. Uh, can we do the last try? Uh, Korak, are you audible or should we? Okay, so let us try with the flash talk. Uh, for the flash talk, we have Alex, uh, P. Alex from India. He's going to talk about a right to be forgotten. Uh, Alex. Uh, hi, um, I'm, I'm extremely sorry, but uh, can I go a second because I'm having a trouble with my laptop uh, by presenting because I have a slide too. Okay. Uh, then can we have Deborah Irene Christine from Indonesia? Oh, can you hear me clearly? Deborah? Yes. Uh, can you yes. hear me clearly? Sure. So we have Deborah from Indonesia. She's going to talk about civil society evolving cybersecurity risk landscape. Uh, you have five minutes. You have the mic. Uh, Hello everyone, I'm Debra, uh, I'm from Indonesia. I was told that I only have three minutes actually, so I'm going to briefly talk about the evolving cyber threat landscape of cyber civil society groups worldwide to stimulate our discussion on the issue or simply a food for thought for you. Um, cyber attacks on civil society groups and organizations from NGOs. Sorry to interrupt, sorry, Debra. Uh, can you uh, turn up the volume a little bit? or um, talk, speak closer to the microphone. Sorry. How about now? Sorry. It's still me? very poor. Um, sorry, Christine, what about now? It's Hello. still too low to listen to, sorry. Uh, test, 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 is this okay now? Mm. No, can you try, sorry, can you try the uh, left um, left button next to the microphone where you can uh, go to audio and turn up the volume, the input volume of your microphone? Yeah, sorry. Uh... Sorry, let's just give her. Yeah, what about now? It's better, but you can still turn up a little. Yeah, it's already the maximum level, actually. I think that's acceptable. So, okay. um, yeah, let's go ahead. Okay. So, again, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Deborah. I'm from Indonesia. I'm going to briefly talk about the evolving cyber threat landscape of civil society groups worldwide to stimulate our discussion on the issue or just simply a food for thought for you. Uh, as you can see here uh, in the slides that I'm uh, uh, yeah, showing to you, cyber attacks on civil society groups and organizations from NGOs, humanitarian organizations, think tanks to nonprofits are on the rise. While they are no stranger to politically motivated attacks by state and state sponsored actors, they are increasingly targeted by cyber criminals who are after the money provided by donors. Recent cases of ransomware attack and sophisticated phishing attack against different NGOs and CSOs are just some examples of the evolving cyber security threat landscape of civil society groups. Despite growing cyber threats from all sides, civil society groups find themselves in a greater state of vulnerability and precarious position in the cybersecurity system. Cyber attacks do not only prevent civil society groups from fulfilling their missions, but can also harm their service users, which are often vulnerable populations. Imagine sensitive data of refugees that is kept by NGOs being targeted in a ransomware attack. Despite this concerning situation, most civil society groups have limited resources to invest in products and services beyond their mission-oriented needs, including in cybersecurity products and services. Compared to their adversaries, civil society groups are under-resourced and under capacity in terms of cybersecurity and cyber resilience. Besides this issue, civil society groups' marginalization in cybersecurity discourse, processes, and practices 
as to their vulnerable and precarious position in comparison to other actors like states, the technical community, and the private sector. How are they marginalized? First, cyber threats targeting civil society are underrepresented in cyber threat reporting, widely used by cybersecurity researchers and practitioners. This has created a distorted view of the general cyber threat landscape. Second, in a lot of countries, including in the APAC region, they are excluded from the target beneficiaries of the national computer security incident response teams. Third, tech service providers often fail to offer adequate incident response support for civil society groups using their service. There is a significant gap between the support that civil society groups need and what the tech companies are willing to provide. Fourth, and this is a classic issue, the participation of civil society groups representing communities affected by cyber operations in civil in cybersecurity policymaking processes is often tokenistic, resulting in outputs that rarely meet civil society groups' concerns. Against this backdrop, there is no single one-fits-all solution. And I look forward to discussing with you on what can be done at different levels to strengthen the, the cybersecurity of civil society groups. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deborah, uh, for that uh, wonderful speech. Uh, now, can we have Alex P. Alex from India? Yes, certainly. Thank you so much. Uh, Alex uh, is going to talk about a right to be forgotten. He's from India. Alex, you have the mic. You have four minutes. Sorry for the time, you know. So. Sure. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. So I am Alan P. Alex from India. I uh, am here to talk about right to be forgotten. So who wouldn't want their information, their information which they don't like to be out there in the public, accessible for everyone out there. So right to be forgotten is a concept that evolved in 2011 through a landmark case, which, which happened to be from Google, which happened in Spain. So let's quickly go on to the next slide. So as far as information is concerned, it's gone out those days when newspaper reporting and official or government records are the, where the only sources of personal information. And right now, users are not the only one who can create information on about themselves on the website. In fact, we have a lot of private and public agencies who save the data about individuals in databases manually or through big data algorithms and everything. And that is a huge risk out there. And because of that, digital shadows of an individual would soon outnumber the actual data we create. Because of the advent of IoT and technologies, we have a huge risk of data being stored or our shadows being there imprinted, accessible to a lot of people or possible outcomes out there to misuse the data. And as far as our digital footprint is concerned, Whatever we browse, like, share, comment, upload, shop, or messages we send and receive are currently under surveillance. Believe it or not, but we are under scrutiny. And you won't be surprised if, uh, if, if something that you talk about with your friend today would serve as, for instance, some content or a product which you talk about a friend would serve as the next day, uh, as your suggestion from many websites or even Google. Because everything you talk is being heard everything you see everything you browse is out there and that sometimes scares and talking about how the whole concept happened the google spain case so in that particular case a, a, a person who wanted to take some data out of the website regarding a news publication which happened to uh, you know happen uh, which happened to infringe upon his right uh, to be known 
in another way which he doesn't want to. So in that case, the court found that Google processed inf personal information by allowing any internet user to access a structured overview of information relating to that individual on the internet by searching for that individual's name. So what does that mean? Basically, that means that whatever information that is out there on the internet, Google happens to have a specific algorithm which links everything about that person related to that name out there for anyone to access freely. And that is that won't be possible without that specific algorithm, which is why this particular case was a key highlight in the right to be forgotten concept. So even precise data processing that is legal at the moment can be incompatible with the law over time, which is one specific and important highlight that court, the court pointed out because sometimes some laws or some concepts that we have right now won't, will be redundant in the coming years. And that would create a huge risk of data being out there. So even for all of that, we need this particular concept to be out there specifically and clearly implemented. So there might be an instance where you might get conf confused with the right to privacy and right to be forgotten. So let me just dissect both of them and put this forward. So right to privacy, it's basically, um, it refers to information that is not, public, not publicly available. I mean, some information that's not at all publicly available, but right to be forgotten happens after that. So you put some information into the internet and your privacy is infringed because that particular data or information you put out there should have been misused or some wrong information out there uh, is something which you don't want to be there. So it's the data is already there and you want to take it down. So and right to privacy for that information, it won't be there and it won't be there. So there's the difference between right to be forgotten and right to privacy. And what is the solution? So uh, before two years back, geo-blocking that was uh, the main criteria which was followed which means a, a particular search engine or an intermediary who is requested to take down a particular link is would only take down that content or access in that particular country or region but nowadays it has become redundant and has and it's become fairly easy to access that information by using vpns or other mechanisms like various softwares so in that case you know um complying with a tribunals or a specific uh, authorities order to take down a particular content won't work and only global blocking can be the only solution forward which means taking down that content from the whole you uh, know restricting the access to any person sitting anywhere around the world because you know even in even if that particular country or uh, that access is blocked in a particular country it won't make any sense because it can be reaccessed anytime and plus it the access the only the access is not is only denied and not the actual data the data stays there and we don't know if the data is deleted and we we don't have mechanisms or foolproof mechanism to say that that particular data is deleted forever so even if the content is blocked or the access is restricted some way someone out there someone who can actually pull out the strings or have the aggregate authority can actually access the data and that is a conundrum that we have to face. And what is and this is the only way forward, a system that allows some of the digital shadow to be purged is most logical. So uh, by concluding, I would say a system that allows who, who claims to have who uh, to not use the data or store the data in a way which we don't want should be the possible way forward. And it is a priceless thing to move forward with so that the data and the content shouldn't be stored without a person's consent and it shouldn't be there in the internet if that particular person don't want it to be. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, uh, thank you for that uh, short uh, information. So now um, I'm, I'm probably rushing in because time is running out and we have we still have a theme um, talk and, and one more um, flash uh, speaker. So flash talk speaker. So can we have Muhammad Afig Amar Tulas from Malaysia? He's going to talk about digital inclusion from the perspective of internationalized uh, domain name IDNs. Um, uh, so Muhammad, you have the mic. Yes, thank you, Shudip.
So hi, assalamualaikum, namaste. Uh, my name is Afik, and I'm from Malaysia. And I will today I will talk about uh, digital inclusion from the perspective of internationalized domain names. So what is IDN? IDN is basically internationalized domain names that enable people from around the world to use domain names in their own local languages and scripts. Uh, it is formed using characters from different scripts, such as Arabic, Chinese, Cyrillic, and Devanagari. And all of these scripts are encoded by the Unicode standard and used in accordance with relevant IDN protocols. And IDN is meant to develop and promote a multilingual uh, internet. So not necessarily um, we use ASCII format, but also we can use uh, local language and scripts. And it, it's currently being adopted at the top level. Sorry, sorry. I heard voices. <laughs> okay, so I'll continue. Um, so IDN is being adopted also in the top level domain, including the in the CCTLD and also the GTLD, the country code top level domain and also the generic top level domain. So currently there are 61 IDNs under the CCTLD and 93 uh, under the GTLD that has been delegated. So why IDN is important? In connecting the IDN with the digital inclusion initiative, we have to note that the digital inclusion were meant uh, and introduced as a strategy to assist in addressing the digital divide, which may affect people from diverse backgrounds, various educational levels, and differentiate people based on its localization, based on their, their localization or geographical area. And digital inclusion will be hard to achieve if the internet is not flexible enough and limited to only one language. As we stand with one internet, we shall also stand with uh, we shall also stand with that one internet is for all. And therefore, we must uh, look into the importance of equal open opportunity for those people to get connected and getting their voices heard. I believe IDN is also important uh, in supporting the Digital Inclusion Initiative, which will help us in create three Cs, which is uh, convenient, uh, provide convenient environment for the internet, provide a more confident level towards the consumers and also to improve capabilities of the consumers as well. So um, as the internet is said to be a lifeline during this pandemic, it is such a perfect time for us to note that digital literacy can be so important for all of us in continuing our daily activities that helps to keep uh, relevancy and sustainability in many sectors such as uh, administration, judiciary, education, and also the medical sectors, which previously may require a traditional approach, but it is proven now that it may also proceed online. However, for some of us, the, the digital divide and digital literacy are just too far away where they need something like the IDN to ensure that they will not be left behind forever. Instead, they are capable to continue to survive using the internet as their lifeline. When we discuss about what are the challenges of the IDN, I will give three challenges. Uh, the first one is the user perception and awareness. Not so many of them uh, aware or um, having a trust to, um, to use the IDN or to, uh, to adopt the IDN. Second one is the application support. Uh, we need more support from the applications providers, service providers, so social media platforms to um, to adopt and to support the IDN's characters and languages. And also we need the technology support in terms of devices, especially on the keyboard, on the keyboard part that we need um, local entrepreneurs or local inventors to come in and help uh, building more devices and more um, technology support for the IDN. And I just would like to share a bit on, sorry. I would like to share a bit on IDN in Malaysia. So basically, we are having three IDNs in Malaysia. We have Jawi, Tamil, and Chinese, which um, represent uh, three uh, big races in Malaysia, where uh, the total registration now is at 2,107 registration as at 31st of August. And we have so many initiatives, but we have so many challenges as well. But um, if you can see that uh, the percentage of IDN registrations versus ASCII registration is still very low, but with the continuous initiatives and continuous 
uh, promotion of digital inclusion, we believe that we might be able to improve the IDN's uh, adoption in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Shridip. Uh, thank you, Muhammad. Uh, sorry for being so tight on time because <laughs> time is running out and due to the technical issues, yeah, I'm trying uh, we still have. Uh, I'm trying my, uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> But, but this is uh, an idea about what goes behind the session. So this was an experience for the fellows to know the, uh, the reality of uh, behind the scene of the sessions. Mm -hmm. So now let's go back to the cybersecurity trust theme. Uh, in this theme talk, uh, we have four, four speakers. Uh, now I hand over the mic to uh, Cora. Please introduce your group. Uh, you have less than 13 minutes uh, within which you have to manage the Q&A as well. So Cora, you have the mic. Hi, everyone. Am I audible now? Loud and clear. Um, thanks to the organizers for having us. Um, sorry for the inconvenience earlier. I have three other fellows with me. Samik, who is a journalist. Dikshya, who is a student. And Rajesh, who is a police officer. This separate slot really gave us a sense of responsibility that we have a voice and individual contribution in shaping our digital community. That being said, internet provides us with the power and we need to realize the fact that with great power comes great responsibility. Every day, a large number of people get access to the digital world, even those who don't have awareness about ground rules of technology. I belong to a developing country where the focus towards internet is increasing day by day. My people are new to technology as compared to other uh, developed countries in the world. Most of them don't even realize that there is a human sitting on the other side of the screen. So there is a dire need of an authority to serve the purpose of spreading awareness of internet law especially. By doing so, honestly, I think half the problems of Gen Z can be solved as we spend most of our time on the internet. Diksha, would you like to come forward and talk about how human factors should be introduced to technologies? Yeah, uh, thank you, Kora. So I'd be talking about human aspects of technology. Uh, we need to take into consideration that technology was first founded on, uh, on the ground that it was founded to make human life convenient. Uh, and technology is for human being, right? So. Uh, we need to uh, we need to when we talk about cyber security we need to keep in mind that the consequences of cyber breaches or security breaches are faced by human beings uh, the human aspect in information technology is fundamental we need to lead by a human centric approach while dealing with issues relating to cyber security uh, Harassment, uh, uh, also from a policy level too, in internet laws and policies are made by the ruling class and oftentimes the police's, uh, policies and laws uh, don't take marginalized voices into consideration, which in long term doesn't make the internet a safe space for them and as a consequence directly affect their access and participations. In Nepal, we don't have a separate act. Uh, our law to address the issues relating to cyber securities. The laws and policies are scattered all over the places. Uh, we have Electronic Transaction Act 2008, National Criminal Code 2017. However, the laws are often uh, being used to criminalize expressions of marginalized voices rather than safeguarding and making internet a safe space. Uh, so while we talk about technology, we need to think about human being and how uh, while people stay and interact in uh, stay and interact on the in internet, it directly uh, or indirectly have a psychological effect on human beings. Thank you. My partner, uh, Rajesh, <laughs> also express similar views on this. Um, thank you, Diksha. Yes, we already have so many loopholes in the cyber laws. We need to think about how this can affect security in developing countries. Actually, Rajesh raised a very intelligent point about increased crime rate regarding e-banking during pandemic. Most of our people were newly introduced to e-banking during the quarantine. Authorities need to take a notice that if even if a PIN code is provided by the user, the system of banking shouldn't be so fragile to be revolving around a mere code. 
Even after finding the scammers, banks deny to lodge a case and call it a mistake of the client. If our money is not safe in the banks, then why should we keep it there in the first place? You know, some ha someone has to take the responsibility of online transactions. We know one is only as strong as their weakest link. So I would like to add a personal incident that happened to me last night when I was transferring money to my brother who was standing on a bus stop. So in hurry, I entered a wrong digit to his account number and my money got transferred to a wrong account. So within seconds, I connected to the helpline, but none of them took responsibility, not even the bank, not the helpline. If money can be transferred through internet to the wrong recipient, why cannot it be returned to the owner that too in a matter of seconds? Rajesh, could you please put light on increasing crime rates during lockdown in your area in Nepal? Yeah, hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can, we can hear, you. hear you. Yeah, I'm Rajesh. I'm from Nepal Police. So uh, this was uh, this was the last data we have. So you see, uh, before the lockdown, uh, before that uh, COVID, uh, we have almost zero, like the the data of online fraud or this is the online fraud data. So it, it it's almost like a zero, and we have some lottery fraud. That's some three, and. Uh, almost no on in, in one year and another time it's, it was a two. So after the, uh, since the lockdown pan, uh, sorry, since that uh, pandemic, you know, the new train uh, work from home and online transactions were rise. So then the developing country like Nepal, we also start using uh, the same as the whole world did. So then the, uh, after after the pandemic, uh, the scam case has been raised, and every day we, uh, we just uh, got some case of five to ten in each police station. And so uh, this is the data of, uh, that you know. Uh, this is a uh, Facebook page called ML Electronics, and uh, and you know uh, lots of cases have been lost within this page. While you ask the data with uh, Facebook, then they say that uh, the page is uh, like uh, it's a uh, page uh, registered with with uh, Nigerian IP address. So we cannot do anything with that case. So that's for me. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. I must say that same kind of stuff has been happening in Pakistan too. People have started to have trust issues regarding their privacy. They believe that authorities, instead of tracking crimes through data, utilize this personal information in promoting brands. When I talk to several people around me to ask them why don't they trust internet with their privacy, a friend stated that she does online shopping on a website and starts getting ads related to it very next moment. And I think this is very relatable to all of us. We watch a movie on Netflix and next day our feed is full of clips from that movie. People are not really satisfied with their privacy being sold for business purposes. Some of my fellows also stated that their account got uh, accounts reach got uh, limited because they posted about Palestine and other uh, contradiction, uh, other issues with con con um, contradicting opinions. They call it a biased internet algorithm. People have started to think that internet picks sides and decides whose human rights matter the most. Samik, are you here? Do you want to talk about how internet community should ensure trust among users? Samik, are you speaking? Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, okay, but like um, just um, lighting uh, um, uh, the talk. Um, so like we're we're progressing into the digital transactions and platforms for ease. Um, however, we we don't consider what happens to our private data. That's for like a country like ours or Pakistan or Nepal. However. Um, 
for me, these platforms and policies have, um, uh, for me personally, they have failed to gain confidence. So I don't use any of the digital wallets or digital transactions myself. Um, I've, I've been more stuck with uh, traditional ways of payment, sidelining all the digital payment method methods. Uh, and uh, uh, the fraud is likely to increase because uh, as Razi C like pointed out from zero to being like five or 10 cases a day, because like um, the uses of digital wallet um, and online transaction were rare before the pandemic. So more, more people are using it. They are more acquainted to the platform. So um, the frauds are likely to increase in the very days to come. So this is a very new facility for Nepal. And I think um, um, my perspective is like, um, it should be, uh, it's not be treated um, like other crimes. Um, uh, this is a very civil society perspective um, uh, because um, this is very new and uh, people are not really aware about um, how, how to even function with these platforms. Um, also the question is like, um, uh, this, is the, this is a question for my colleague as well, Razisi. Uh, so these financial crimes uh, be treated by police? Do they have the expertise to do so? Uh, or even like what, the, what expertise does the state have, have to treat these uh, financial frauds? And so they call it frauds or crimes, you know? And who ensures accountability for my data? Um, so yeah, uh, even like me being and uh, with tech and revolving around it, I deny, um, I mostly deny to use these platforms, um, which are very embryonic stays. Um, the problem I see with transactions is maybe um, some of the users are not aware of what they are committing, uh, what crimes they are even committing, you know. And crime is a really big word to put into this very, um, very uh, like um, first embarked journey into digital endeavors. That's my thought. Uh, so, what can be done about it? Um, it's a very it's a very good old way we always talk about, um, uh, like uh, the major step has to be the government to regulate these platforms and ensure data trust, and also ensure accountability and trust when, um, and even when they procure like uh, uh, third party companies for data purposes, uh, this would be very accountable about that. Um, also in um, uh, like for a country like ours, like, you know, we are, we are caught between two sides, you know, like we, we use both analog and digital methods. So we're actually stepping into two boats and um, yeah, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very problematic journey, I think. Because like, um, uh, not just crimes, you know, like uh, I, ca I, can, I can relate to um, stock markets and um, shares, which exponentially increased um, during when they switched to digital platforms um, that happened like a year ago. And everyone was like uh, investing in shares and stocks in Nepal, which exponentially increased. And it was like, everyone was doing it. But what is, what is the accountability there? And um, where is the transparency? You know, that is my question. And I would like to open the floor now, like um, if uh, similar cases uh, or similar issues have been with in your countries or reason. Yeah. Uh. Samik, uh, sorry to interrupt, but we just have one minute left. Uh, so I think if you guys can connect, you guys can share it, you guys can talk it in the different groups as well. Uh, uh, so uh, lastly, I would like to thank all the speakers, all the mentors, the MSG, uh, the staff uh, who have uh, contributed so much. And, 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 you know, with this energy, with this engagement, keep engaging in social media, keep, uh, you know, striving um, to, uh, to excellence. And, uh, and let's have a photo. So, uh, so Christine will be taking some screenshot of the session. So please open up your cameras for the photo session. Christine, please take over. Yes, I'm trying to turn on my camera as well, if you can see. Okay. Uh, just give it. Okay, one, two, three. All right, let me turn off the timer as well. <laughs> 